so glad you're with us today. Black Voters Matter. And of course, Commissioner Rodney Ellis, Texas Harris Commission, Texas Harris County Commissioner Rodney Ellis, before he goes on the other side of the break, is going to break this law down for us so we can see how we can make it work up in Wisconsin. State Representative Dr. Lakeisha Myers, a teacher. Can't wait to talk with her about it. And Frank Watkins, uh, this is an idea that Reverend Jackson has been espousing for decades, for decades, for decades. And he's going to walk us through how they actually enacted that years ago. Back with more Keep Up Alive in just a minute. Was uh, they they with us? No, no. No, we're going to get Daryl Jones. Five nine four four six seven three. How many of you have pets? You may think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life, but unfortunately, there are countless pets out there who don't have a home Ooh. to call their own. However, Bob's from Sketchers is trying to change that. With every purchase of adorable Bob's oh, right. or pet accessories, Sketchers makes a donation to Pet Go Love. And with your help, <sighs> we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and donated over $7 oh, my million. Dollars. Find Bob's at a Sketchers store. Latasha Brown? Hold on, hold on. Okay. Or wherever stylish footwear is right. Good morning. Join Macy's and Girls in the new generation of leaders now during Women's History Month. Throughout March, you can fund mentorships, start college, and career wellness programming for girls. When you donate online to girls, hey, hey, what's up? Hey, girl, how are you? And I am well. I'm well, hearing your voice. You look fabulous in the pictures. I said, now, I wish I could be that glamorous on the picket line, but that's all right. <laughs> Girl, look, just go on and be beautiful. Just, ha just have just have enough nerve to be gorgeous, okay? Okay, okay. Just, just go on and be that. Don't apologize for it. Inspire me. All right. Okay? okay. That's all I'm saying. You don't, don't apologize for that. I mean, that's because I think that's what hems people up. You know, we put forth our best effort. We do our thing. And then we're like, oh, well, you know, I'm just, no, uh-uh. I'm just trying to be all that I can be. Be big or stay home. Leave me alone. I say. How about that? I say. Okay. So, hello, Attorney Daryl Jones. How you feeling today? I'm feeling great, feeling great, Santita. Good morning to you. Okay, don't talk about me trying to keep myself together. I said, wait a minute, Daryl Jones is feeling tired? What? I can't believe it. <laughs> and, of course, we've got Wisconsin State Representative Lakeisha Myers, uh, who is also a teacher. So, before she wraps us on our knuckles, gets us straight to death. <laughs> oh, you know. Good morning, good morning, everyone. You know, you're always very measured. I can tell you're a teacher. <laughs> but we got to know, <laughs> man, I get, but Texas Harris County Commissioner, our dear friend Rodney Ellis is going to set the table for us before he goes. He and Reverend Jackson have been down in Atlanta, Reverend Frank Watkins and Reverend Dr. Yuri at uh, Uncle Andy, Reverend, Reverend Ambassador Mayor Andrew Young's 90th birthday party. Wow. You know, it's hard when you look at these pictures of him all these years ago. To think that he's 90? Oh my gosh. God bless him. You got Reverend Yuri on, sir. Reverend Yuri, I think he did. Almost 11 o'clock last night. The white celebration oh. with the whispers. Oh, so you so that's what happened with you all. Oh, y'all are tired because you were rocking steady. Is that it? They were partying. You, late know, they, you know they were. Oh. <laughs> but you know what? I went to. Um, one of my brother, when he was in college, one of his one of my brother's parties, because he had the, he had the biggest best party at the Black Caucus. It was great. The best party. The best. <laughs> Girl, I went there and I saw all my fellow Howardites, and you know, you used to be able to dance, do your thing, honey. Midway through a song, these men were holding their knees, that blowing was. real hard. <laughs> I said, "Oh, this is not twenty years ago, my friend." <laughs> Cold, soaked. I said, stand by. Here we go. I'm coming to you, Commissioner Ellis. Okay. Where he those parties is now the wharf. Oh, I know. I loved it. Left the Black Caucus dinner getting over there. We get in. Oh, I'm just my 
Hey everybody, hey, 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 welcome to Keep Hope Alive, the second hour. We're talking about getting our young people registered to vote. Reverend Jackson for decades has been espousing the idea that when high school seniors graduate, they should have a diploma in one hand and a voter registration card in the other. And indeed, Texas state law uh, has required for, since the mid, since the early 80s, that, uh, that Texas high school principals in public and private high schools act as registrars and provide registration materials to their students and get them registered to vote if they were going to be 18 by the end of the year. Wow. So it's, it's a great idea. It's a revolutionary idea. We say, you know, sometimes some great old things come out of Texas. Talk to us, Texas Harris County Commissioner. Uh, Rodney Ellis, talk to us about that. Because you said as a state senator, you didn't have as many resources as you have now as the commissioner of one of the largest counties in the United States. State legislation is out in large numbers until the Voting Rights Act. So I guess in 72, Mickey Leland and Eddie Bernice Johnson and folks who went to the State House in Texas, Reverend Rand, the president in 84, uh, it may have inspired this law in 85. A bill was passed in Texas legislation that requires every public and private school to distribute voter registration applicants to eligible students at least twice a year. The late Representative Paul Ragsdale, a Dallas Democrat, Died in 2011, sponsored the bill that led the way for this law that requires all principals to serve as voter registrars and, and, and register eligible voters, voters eligible to sue twice a year. The Secretary of State is required to provide principals with instructions for requesting voter registration cards, but that office of Texas cannot enforce the law and is not even required to track requests for ballot uh, applications for registration. Studies have shown that not many schools request voter registration applications. That was a 2020 report from the Texas Civil Rights Project that says that in previous reports, they found that while they can uh, identify a general upward trend in compliance with high school voter registration, most schools across the state don't do it. We have over 1,000 school districts. Civil Rights Project did a report in 2011 that verified a significant increase over the previous three years, 38% increase in public high schools in Texas with at least 20 senior students um, who had filed com complaints because the law had not been um, followed. I was mentioning that uh, earlier, that Reverend, you brought this up, maybe Reverend inspired the law, I'm not sure, as is the case with a lot of things we do, including many of the bills I passed when I was a state senator, you can't always put the money in for enforcement. It is good to go back and revisit that law and see what, what you can put in that requires some kind of public notification, some data reporting. Frank Watson on the call earlier, as a student he is all the time, made reference to voter registration, a motor voter. It used to be a state by state process. There's a federal law now. Anytime you interact with the government in terms of public assistance, put your data on file. They are required to comply with it to go ahead and register you to vote. Santina, I'm glad to be on here with attorney Daryl Jones. I heard you mention Todd Yeary. Mm -hmm. I heard Latasha Brown, uh, boy, and of course, Representative Myers, who I've observed for a long time. She used to work for somebody that came into the legislature in Wisconsin a little after I went to the Texas legislature. She used to work for my friend Lana Turner over there, who she took still in office. I think she's still in state center. But looking good to be with you. I'd watch Pick it up from here. Maybe David is still on the line. I'm not sure. I'm going to go beat your dad. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, you all have a good time since they were rocking steady at Andrew Young's 90th birthday celebration, of course, with the whispers. Thank you so much, Texas Harris County Commissioner Rodney Ellis. It's always a joy to be with. Love you. Love you. All right. Well, let me go. Let me go around here. I mean, Latasha Brown, you, are, you have your feet pumped boots on the ground, uh, getting people registered to vote. What about this? Um, it's Texas state law. It's not really enforced, but, you know, maybe tie it to, uh, you know, tie someone's salary or bonus. Uh, 
you know, principal salary or bonus to getting people registered to vote, that can get a little hairy because, you know, this is nonpartisan, right? You're just trying to get kids registered to vote. Well, number one, what do you think of the idea of tying your, uh, your voter registration card to your uh, high school graduation? You know, if you walk across that stage and get that diploma, you should have a voter registration card in the other hand. I think that there is a way, I think it's an excellent idea to make sure that we're registering young people and we're bringing them into the process. I think there are ways to bring them in the process where they feel empowered. You know, I think there's ways to bring them in the process where they really recognize the power of choice. I think it's a way to bring them in the process where they actually feel a sense of their own agency. And part of, you know, uh, I am founder of a of, of two organizations, co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, and I'm the founder of a, a network called the Southern Black Girls and Women's Consortium. And we're actually going to go on tour over the summer. Our young women who are ambassadors, they're all high school leaders. The beauty about the one of the things, one of the projects uh, that I'm lifting up that I actually kind of created maybe 20 years ago was called a, a program called Super Birthday Tuesday. And what we would do is every single black person has a birthday. We know that. And and we all want to feel special on our birthday. And so every month we would go to high school um, and hold a birthday party during the lunch period. Um, uh, and we would have cake, we would have balloons, we would have stickers. Um, and everybody that turned 18 in that month uh, we would, or, or until the, from the last time we came there, we would encourage them, or even if it's, they didn't turn 18 that month, if they turned 18 and, and they had not registered a vote, we were literally creating something to draw them as well. And so we would have this voter registration that would actually make it better and an opportunity to lift up. And so the students would come. It was amazing uh, because the students would come to get, we thought that the big draw was going to be the piece of cake that they would come and get a piece of cake, um, but we had these balloons. The amazing thing for me was that how the boys would get excited about balloons, and we couldn't understand why the boys wanted the balloons, but then we realized we would see girls going down the hallway, and we would see girls with the balloons. We're like, oh, the boys are getting the balloons and giving it to the girls. <laughs> um, and and, and, and cause we were creating, we wanted to create this environment where we would actually honor and let folks, almost like a right to pass it, to know that they they had agency and they were powerful and that they had a story. And so I think there are ways that young people, that if we're engaging them um, in ways of where they already are, a lot of our work that we do, we always have music. Culture is a powerful tool. So I think that when we create these spaces that are literally rooted in the culture of the time, that young people respond and help them understand the why, you know, that help them understand that they have power in this process. That's part of what I found over the years that has been the most effective. Um, and the most, I think, vote, voter registration, like uh, uh, Reverend Jackson says all the time, I believe every single school, every program they have, every time they're having a basketball game or a football game, they should be lifting up you know, voting registration, not necessarily from the framework, I think, of, oh, this is just what you owe, but this is your power. Like, from the framework of this is your power and we want you engaged. And I have found that that has been the most effective tool to get them involved. Mm. What say you, Reverend, you say Reverend Attorney Daryl Jones, you do have a ministerial zeal with, your, zeal with your approach to your work. You and Barbara Arnwine and the Transformative Justice Coalition, of which you were chair, have been in... Brunswick, Georgia, you know, particularly when no eyes were there. You know, Reverend makes the point, you make the point, Attorney Arnwine, or everybody here, uh, Reverend Watkins, Reverend Yuri, Wisconsin State Representative Letitia Myers, make the point that only registered voters can get on juries. Uh, do you think, um, just with the, all of the attention that was focused just on that particular case on the, that we're still looking at, the Ahmad Arbery case, uh, do you think it would make a difference with young people if, uh, how would it impact them if if their principals were registrars, voter registrars, if, 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 you, if they got a voter registration card in one hand and their diplomas in the other? Uh, do you think that now in this 
in this particular moment where we've had Breonna Taylor, where we've had Ahmaud Arbery, where we've had George Floyd, where we've had, where we've had, where we've had. Do you think this could make a difference? Could, would you use that to be part of the argument with young people? Well, you know, Cynthia, absolutely uh, that would be part of the argument. And, you know, one of the things that we found when we were in Georgia, not simply for the Ahmaud Arbery case, but prior to that during the runoff, and, and I believe that Natasha would speak to it as well, is that as we went around uh, trying to encourage young people to come out of our vote and participate in the 2020 election, one of the things that we were continually doing was the monitoring, was Richard you know, were the actions of police and taking lives of black and brown uh, youth. The youth were activated. And one of the things that uh, I, I continually push on people is, not to say that our youth are not active, that they're not politically active. But it was the political activity of the youth that brought down the Confederate statue. It was the political activity of the youth that brought about uh, all of the notoriety of policing and, 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 uh, and the George Floyd uh, 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 Policing Act. It was the action of the youth that kept at the forefront the environmental battle. So to, to connect with the youth, if they're there, they're active. And I think that if you add that other level to it, the next step to it, and you start talking about the student loan debt and, their, and all the jobs and the building of the jobs, but then you start going into those high schools and you start uh, asking and encouraging the high school seniors to actually register and to get involved. And I think that the more that that happens, the more engaged they become. In a lot of the states across uh, our country, uh, we have, uh, you know, community service requirements for high school students. Registering to vote should be part of that community service requirement and, and then engaging those students into the activity of voting. You know, in Brunswick, Georgia, when, when we were down in Brunswick, Georgia, one of the things that we noted that as we were doing our protests, as we were doing our, uh, our marches through the streets every Thursday to encourage the community to come out and get active, get involved, and, and support what was happening. What we noticed was not only were there uh, people that were homeowners, et cetera, that were coming out to join us, but there were, there were kids that were coming from high school because it was right after they were getting out of high school. They would come and join in because they were concerned. They got it. The message was there. They wanted to be involved. They wanted to be engaged. So you know, I, I think it's a, a part of meeting your voters, your potential voter, voters, where they are. And if where they are in, are in the, is in the high school, then we need to get into the high schools and do it. It's disappointing. It was very disappointing to hear Commissioner Ellis say that uh, in the state of Texas uh, that they are not following up, they, that they are not reinforcing or enforcing uh, their their requirement with regards to the Texas high schools requiring uh, the registers to sign up to high school seniors to vote. That seems like an ideal thing to put in place to have imposed you know, all across the nation. So it's very disappointing to hear that Texas is dropping the ball uh, in that area. And, and certainly it's something that uh, we, we would want to uh, figure out a way to um, to shore up and be certain that they get back in, in, into the ring and uh, and do what this was, uh, what the spirit of this legislation was not it was intended to, to accomplish. Reverend Dr. Todd Neary, what say you? I'm Santita and to Reverend, uh, to go on the breakfast with Rodney Ellis and doing what they do when they get together and to all of your guests. Um, I think to Daryl Jones's last point, a lot of times these, these bills, we've got to make sure that bills are more than permissive, meaning they make it possible without having a requirement to come back and report to the legislature on implementation. But with that, I think it kind of sets why we have to cast a wide net. Not only should we be attempting to register uh, seniors prior to their 18th birthday in high school, a lot of them, when they graduate, and I uh, spent about 10 years uh, teaching Intro to American Government at the University of Baltimore, many of my recently graduated, now first, second year college students fail had not registered to vote, didn't understand why it was necessary. A lot of times the question was, what difference will it make? And I think part of it is it's got to be more than just a check the box exercise, which is in the mind of a lot of 
these young people. They're just saying I need to register, but ain't nobody explaining why my vote's not going to matter. And I think Natasha, who, by the way, held a mass fire rehearsal last Sunday in some. I just need to put that out there. Huh. She made everybody. <laughs> <in the church. laughs> she can sing it, now. She can sing. <laughs> she can sing. It's kind of the same principle, right? We've got to keep holding mass choir rehearsals, getting everybody involved, participating in the singing. The singing is the signing up not only to get the registration card, but then to carry it to its logical next step, which is understanding the issue, understanding the candidate, kind of having a fully embedded, detailed process of walking with students through the process of participating in the, in the election. I will never forget, when your father ran for president in 1984, uh, I was not 18 to vote for him in the primary, but I couldn't wait. I mean, it was so exciting, I was chomping at the bit. And the first moment I had the opportunity to do so, I did because there was something going on in the space that I saw as relevant to me that made me want to make sure I was including in the number and wouldn't be left out the next time. So I think we have to create a sense of urgency. Dr. King talks about the fierce urgency of now. We've got to have that conversation with the young people as they're expressing their own concerns about what their future might look like, what are the issues that matter to them, and then translate that into how they can begin to address those issues through the power of the body. Mm. Wisconsin State Representative, Lakeisha Myers, how do you, you're, you're a teacher, you're also a state legislator, how, what could be done just to put teeth in this? The reporting mechanism, I think, is, is the biggest thing to put teeth into it. Um, but I think you're fighting the battle in state legislatures across the country, um, on two fronts. While it may be cute to have motor voter laws that may already be on the book, um, the enforcement mechanism for those for, for those states that have them is something we have to contend with. The other part is what we're seeing now is kind of um, well, I shouldn't say kind of. It is what it is. It's, it's, it's voter suppression. So of those that are actually going through the process to register to vote and trying to clamp down on access to the ballot box. In a state like Wisconsin, we still have to contend with um, understanding voter ID. So I think putting it in the space of where teachers are, where school, in, where school professionals are, and trying to help students register to vote, we have to understand that you still have a segment of students who would have access to getting certain documents that they need to register to vote. So if you need a birth certificate, we have to think about having a student who may be involved in the foster care system. So I'm also thinking outside of just the general students who we know would be able to access their documents, but then going further to, to do the work to actually get the ID. That they should, of what documents you need to actually secure a voting ID, you would need some of those things in Wisconsin that some of my students may not have. Mm -hmm. Now, me as a teacher, I would try to help them obtain those by working with social workers and other folks who would go beyond just the classroom aspect of fill out this paper. Mm -hmm. So, that as well. So, not all of our students come to the you know classroom at the same level with the same ability to obtain those documents. Mm -hmm. and college, college. And you ask the average high school student, what are you doing after high school? They say, I'm going to college, and you have to go beyond that. How do you plan to get there? What are the steps necessary? Let them work through this, and let me help you get to your next point. So I take voting, you know, in the same realm. We have to look at that and not just blanketly say, okay, this is what we need to do, but go through the process of getting our students there. What is the process of getting you registered to vote? And do I have the capacity to do that as just a classroom teacher? If you leave it up to people, 
we have the ability to go so far. Well, you know, but you, you make the point that in a state like Wisconsin, and I've got about a minute left here, uh, when you have these restrictive voter ID laws, it makes it even more difficult for our young people, particularly when you have the cost tied to voter, I mean, to identification and all of that. I mean, in a time when we have got inflation pre-Ukraine that is just really almost unsurvivable. We had problems before the pandemic. I mean, and they've just been increased many fold, many fold. What do you do? I mean, can there be provisions made for people, for these young people? Uh, if, you know, when they, in a state like Wisconsin, you've got these voter ID laws, I mean. You have to look at what is required and then kind of try to work within those parameters to do it. There are individuals that do it. I did it when I was in the classroom. Um, I went above and beyond, though. And you have to make sure that that's a part of your calling to go above and beyond. We just have to do the work. And that's the way I approached my work. Um, it was ministry for me to make sure that my students had, you know, all of the tools that they needed to become effective citizens. Hmm. And I I don't want you to just have voter registration, like uh, Dr. Yuri said. I want you to activate the registration by actually voting and making it mean something to you. What is the issue? What are the issues that mean something to you as a voter that I don't take this voter registration card seriously and say, I want to use it now? Mm. Part of the fear, we go back to fear of people who are against ensuring that we have a wider election. You know, we'll stay right there because Frank Watkins is going to walk us through what he, how he and Reverend Jackson did this decades ago. They actually did do this. I mean, before this law went on the books um, in Texas. So let's talk about it. And throughout the week, I want you to go to rainbowpush.org, rainbowpush.org, join the movement, call Reverend Jackson and our staff. You should be part of the super staff, the volunteer-driven staff. At 773 Freedom, we do need your help. Stay right there with more People for Live in just a few minutes. Get an Uber from the south side. So, well, I can't get an Uber where I live on Sunday morning. I mean, it took me 45 minutes to get. I was like, it's worse than it's worse than it's ever been. Five dollar gas prices. <laughs> yeah, but that wasn't the problem. Yeah, yeah. They were like 20 minutes away. It took me. About seven passes for me to get someone who was coming from my direction, from the south, as opposed to coming from the north. That's messed up about the um, the director from Black Panther getting arrested. Welcome to the real world here, Ryan Cooper. Oh yeah, look at And the girl that called. Listen to that tape. Oh boy, you had his ID. It doesn't matter. You had his debit card. Can you can you say a reminder? That she was a victim. A reminder. <laughs> uh huh. A reminder. Okay. Right. Hi, hi, beautiful people. Thank you for being with us today, Reverend Jackson and and um, Commissioner Ellis. Uh, well, they went to breakfast on their way someplace else, but I'm glad you all are here today, so you can break this down, and we'll go to Fred, get a couple callers in. Stand by. Whew, okay. We're breezy up in here. You're listening to Keep Hope Alive with Reverend Jesse Jackson. 
Call 1-866-594-HOPE. That's 1-866-594-4673. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to Keep Up Alive with, I, with Reverend Jesse Jackson. I'm Tankita Jackson. Reverend Jackson has been in Atlanta. He is in Atlanta. Uh, he was at the 90th birthday party of Andrew Young, the UN ambassador, the mayor of Atlanta, uh, the aide de camp to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, of course, a uh, minister, someone who so much of what we have been able to enjoy today, our freedoms, our liberties, our opportunities, were created by this man. And you saw him really help to recreate a new South he and Maynard Jackson as mayors of Atlanta. We just thank God for Uncle Andy today, 90 years of age. Thank God, God, thank God for giving him so much time. We just love you, Andrew Young. I'm praying for you, Jesse Smollett. He said he was, of course, sentenced to five months in jail this week. Um, a lot of people were shocked by that because it was a class four felony. People are generally given probation. As he walked out of the courtroom, he said, I am not suicidal if anything happens to me. I did not do it. Interestingly enough, yesterday he was classified. He was put in psychiatric hold and they said might self-harm. Pay attention to the Jesse Smollett case. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention everybody. Because he doesn't come from that. He come from, he comes from a very, very strong family there in Chicago and they are with him. So self-harm, that's not how it would happen with him. So let's talk about Texas state law and really what should be federal law. Indeed, Frank Watkins, you say, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, this idea that you and Reverend Jackson have been espousing for decades, Reverend in these push excel rallies, just wherever he would go, uh, just from the 70s on, he said, when you graduate from high school, you should have a diploma in one hand and a voter registration card in the, in the other. And you said, actually, you all took it a step further you know, as you were having these increasingly popular push for excellence rallies that Lou Grant featured on his primetime show on CBS years ago. We had a big event at Dodger Stadium with uh, Aretha Franklin and Sidney Poitier and, so, and Marlon Brando. So many of the stars came out to support that great program. Um, you said that you all really took, you all really actually made this happen. Talk to us about that, Reverend Frank Watkins. Congress passed a law called the Voter Voter. Act. And uh, everybody just focuses on the fact that uh, when uh, you go to your motor vehicle uh, office, that uh, you think that they will offer you the opportunity to register and vote as you get your driver's license or get your car uh, license plate renewed. Um, but the law is actually much, much broader than that. It essentially says that in any contact you have with the federal government, they should offer you the opportunity to register and vote. So if you're involved with the Veterans Administration, if you're involved with Social Security, if you're involved with unemployment insurance, if you're getting out of a federal prison, um, any of these contacts, uh, if you when you register for selective service, any federal contract tax that you have, you should be given the opportunity to register and vote. Hmm. So, well, so what is the deal, Latasha? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Latasha, Reverend Jackson, Reverend Jackson and, and Reverend Watkins and, uh, and C.K. Hoffa, everyone, every, everyone on the panel. Um, in both hours have said, you know, it will take street heat to make this happen. You can pass a law, Latasha, but you've got to have the activism to make it come alive. You know, I often talk about Brown versus Board of Education was 1954. Most schools were not desegregated until the early 70s. Mm. That it has never been policy without people does not fit. We have to create the kind of pressure to make sure that that policy is implemented. Listen, we still don't have the Declaration of Independence implemented in this country. <laughs> All men are free and equal and are endowed by their creator and have access and should have the right to life, living in the pursuit of happiness. We're not there yet. And we will not get there unless the people demand it so. And so I think we have to see the same opportunity. You know, the good thing about Texas 
is that Texas is a real critical state in so many ways. When you look at one of the largest states in, well, the largest state in the United States, and you look at um, the population, uh, there's a major shift and transition happening in that state. That state is actually younger, becoming younger and browner. That if you look at the numbers of who's under the ages of, of 20, of 18, that Texas is actually a majority minority state. And so because of that, there are those that are in power that are abusing their power to actually prevent, to see, to try to prevent people from participating. That a law in itself has never created freedom for us. It has always been people behind, um, behind the policy to push it forth to make it be implemented. And so what I think is we have to do a couple of things. One, we have to push those elected officials in the state of, of Texas to implement to uh, implement all of uh, implement the law. And we have to hold them accountable on that. Two, we also have to create the kind of environment in our community that we are celebrating, that we are literally lifting it up as almost like I said earlier, like a rite of passage. We got to do the work, y'all. And the third thing, even related to that, is we've got to use our innovation, our creativity to find ways for people to be engaged so that we can actually use that. Registration is a tool, but it's only a tool, but part of the power of what I think and the brilliance of the civil rights movement and uh, people like uh, Reverend Jackson did is they always attack power participation. That literally, it can't just about the act of just registration. It is that the, the act and the idea that our community is actually empowering ourselves. We're tapping into our power, and to, for what and, and for for what reason, for what purpose? And so I think if we're lifting up the third piece, is if we're lifting up a vision of what Texas could be. When we're talking to young people, you know, I've got a document where we've been out in the streets. I think we did a uh, we actually did a episode of. Uh, um, a special with CNN where there was a young man out in, I think we were in Tennessee. We were in Tennessee. And there was a young man, and we walked up to him, he was like, don't even ask me, I'm not registering, I'll leave and go, X, Y, you know. He went through the whole thing, and we let him go on, go on with his speech. And we said, well, you know what? We are, and we want to talk to you about what it is it that you care about. We hear what you're saying. We want to know what it is that you care about. And so after a series of really engaging him, and listening to him, we never asked him to register. Either. We just we put it on. We was like, well, we do think you need to register, but right now in this moment, we want to hear what he care about. Well, we talked about what he cared about, and then we shared with him the perspective of how voting can actually impact those things that he care about. Right. So instead of it being about this vote was greater than who he was, what our focus was to remind him of his own power and how powerful he is and to connect the things that he cares about to how voting is a practical tool that can help with that. And as we were walking off, we told him, we was like, well, we're going to see you again because we're going to keep coming around. And as we were walking away, he came up to us and said, go on and give me, I want to register. Hmm. I want to register. And I think part of that is we have to literally be able to tap into the minds and the, the capture the minds by the imagination of our people to really be able to connect and see why they should vote. You know, for, for, for many of us who have been in this world, it is evident and it is obvious. But let's be honest, the other side has done a, a an effective job at beating people down to make them feel like their vote doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They've done an effective job with their abuse of power and make people feel like they just don't have any input or they don't have any power. And we have to counter that. And the way that we counter that is we got to make the connection point. We have to help make the connection point for people around how participation is a form of power. That is not just about your vote matters, is that you matter and that your vote is a tool to actually operate in and use your agency to change the environment that you're around, to actually hold people accountable, to move some folk in the office and to move some out. And when we have taken that approach, where we're actually helping people to understand that they are important, that they are centered in that, is a shift. You know, they, I, I used to hear people all the time tell folks, if you don't vote, you don't count. How disrespectful that is. Human beings' value is not because of what the U.S. government said. People have value because God created them. Mm -hmm. And so we start from that place. We start from the place that you matter, you count, your voice matters. And voting is an extension 
of your voice that literally when your community is under attack, when your community is under need, as, as need, when you actually see something greater and better for your community, it is your responsibility and your power to use every single tool available to you. And we cannot overlook that voting is that tool within this political system that we're in. But what we do is we shift the paradigm on that the focus is the value is not just on, on, on your vote. The focus and value is on you. And your vote is a part of the way that you operate and use your voice. Uh, let me go to Fred from Los Angeles. Fred, what's on your mind today? Good to hear your voice. Hello. I think that was Natasha talked about empowerment and the right to pass it. Be careful what you wish for. She just might get it. I think what she's going to do is create a, a, a naive electorate, case in point. Uh, tell me an 18-year-old wouldn't vote for a $40 an hour minimum wage. A better deal is raising for $50 an hour. You, you had one of your panelists already talk about student loan debt, so it made my point better than me. An 18-year-old is going to vote for that to go away. And this one is for Frank Watson. Tell me about an 18-year-old, how they're going to vote when it comes when it's concerning the Vietnam War. In case in point, uh, I got to vote when I was 18, the very first year that 18-year-olds were, were to vote on the Vietnam War. So we're in a, a precarious situation right now. Tell so, us about that. Well, no, you tell me. Overall, what is your point so that they can, so they can speak to it? Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let me go to you, Frank Watkins, first. Uh, <laughs> uh, when Vietnam was at its uh, highest point, 18 year olds couldn't vote. 1965 to 1971, 19, 19, and uh, was the first year it was I so out, it was so outrageous that within a hundred days they passed the 26th Amendment, allowing 18 year olds to vote, lowering the age from 21 to 18, so that the people who were being sent to Vietnam could vote on the people who were sending the policy that was sending them there. So you're saying that um, that these newly minted voters at, at 18 turned the tide of the Vietnam War, Frank Watkins? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but by that time you had a whole lot of different voters, different bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, Wisconsin State Representative Lakeisha Myers. Oh, well, no, Latasha, whoever wants to jump in, please. What a thing. Oh, come it is, it, it, at 18, you can be drafted. At 18, there are 18 year olds that are going at the, at, at the war, going in war and putting their lives on the line. So at the end of the day, if we if they are able, if they are putting their actual lives on the line, then at some level, why would we think that now all of a sudden they're too naive to vote? I remember as an 18 year old, yes, I did not have the wisdom and the knowledge and the information that I have now. But when I was 18, I was able to see poverty like everybody else. I could experience it like everybody else. At 18, I knew what was fair, what I wasn't getting paid. That as a worker, I was getting exploited. I was making $3 an hour. And something about that didn't sit right with me when I would see others doing the same work that I was doing, making hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? I am sitting, or, or, or in my mind, you know, I, I'm, I'm raising this, is that this notion of young people are naive and not prepared, where's the evidence of that? There has never been a social justice movement in the world that was not fueled and on some level led by young people. Let's not forget that many of the leaders that we see now, including Reverend Jesse Jackson, were in their 20s. These were young people who were leading this. And so I think we have to really recognize that. And, and let me say this. My grandmother saying nothing as dangerous as an old fool. That at the end of the day, what we're seeing right now, we're seeing people literally in from the um, baby boomer generation on down, like literally create 
and are supporting, those are the folks who supported Trump. Those are the people, many of them are the people that supported Trump. I'm raising this because I think that it's really important for us to recognize that all of us are living a shared experience, that all of the policies that are happening right now impact us. I actually, some of the greatest political wisdom I've ever received is when I've gone to a third grade class and asked the children what they want, and they said, we don't want war, we want peace. That's pretty brilliant to me. When I have children that say, I don't want people to be homeless. Perhaps if we thought, as, as in the Bible it says, the children shall leave, perhaps if we put, a, uh, uh, put aside this whole thinking that we have this political sophistication and went back down to the core, the core of our humanity, and, and literally such as children have popped into, I actually believe we would have a greater world. I think we would have better policies. Something that's fundamental, as you talk to the average child, they could tell you around that is wrong. War is wrong. The average child can tell you that they believe that all people need to eat and have access to food and need have to have good schools and that they need to be able to have jobs. So I, I believe that we also are going to have to release some of our ideas that in some ways that young people are not uh, don't have the right to actually have an opinion or don't have enough wisdom to think through these ideas. It is always it's going to take a collective of us, young people, older people, middle-aged people that we are all having a shared experience and because we have the shared experience we absolutely should have shared input and a short shared voice on how we go forward and many of the work much of the work that i'm doing i'm inspired and led by young people hmm. everybody and reverend james bevel and diane nash bevel knew that uh reverend watkins i've got 30 seconds we're being led by young people these days and in the past but it's basically old white people that are leading the effort at voter suppression. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I tell you, um, if you can understand going to war, you can understand voting. Think about that, everybody. And at the, at, you know, a terminal part in our education, it shouldn't end there, but certainly it is high school. I mean, you're of majority age. Most people are. Should you have a voter registration card in one hand and a diploma in the other? Is that not you know, the culmination of your civic education, having a voter registration card? Should not public and private high schools make that compulsory? You think about that. Go to at Rev. J. Jackson on Twitter and throughout the week, reach out to Reverend at 773-FREEDOM, 773-FREEDOM, and um, he'll be ringing the opposing bell at the New York Stock Exchange in a couple of weeks. Congratulations to you, Reverend Jackson. And go to rainbowpush.org and join the movement. Of course, join Latasha Brown at Black Voters Matter. Join Attorney Daryl Jones at the Transformative Justice Coalition. Join us at Rainbow Push, Reverend Dr. Yeri Esquire and Reverend Frank Watkins and Wisconsin State Representative Lakeisha Meyer is going to get some closing thoughts from all of you. I'll keep up alive. Reverend Jesse Jackson, back in a minute. Coming up. We'll have closing thoughts from Reverend Jesse Jackson. Oh, boy. Right here. Thank TV you board. all so much. I'm going to give you, I think we're going to have like a minute of the season. Just under a minute for everybody. Oh, boy. Natasha, you said everything I was going to say. Because I'm telling you, <laughs> these kids have grown up in the, the era of Trayvon Martin. They have, they have grown up seeing all of these things. So they have an informed opinion. So to think otherwise is, is, is naive. Well, you know, sometimes that's right. that's what I think that Fred says things to be provocative, but I think that's also part of his belief system. It's just, um, I just don't. Fred's the right wing Republican. Yeah, yeah. I just, <laughs> I just, I just, I don't agree with it. I just, I, I do exactly. not. Exactly. And to even it. think that, I mean, you have to have young people, for the most part, on the front lines leading the movement, mm -hmm. because marching is primarily a young man's game. Well, you know, I mean, Diane Nash Bevel, then yes. Diane Nash Bevel, and James Bevel, who was really the the brains behind that campaign, the Bombingham campaign. Um, exactly. You know, they said, no, you got to get these young people involved. And they were eager to get involved. That was the thing. They were, the, right. they were the ones who were willing to do it. They said, no, 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 no. You know, I mean, I think of what, when I ask my parents about the impact that, you know, what drove them? They said, each of them, and they grew up in different places. They didn't meet till college. They said, let me tell you, when I saw Emmett Till's picture 
in mm -hmm. that Jet magazine, nothing for me was ever the same. I, I, you know, and just, one of the things, your dad said something, I think, at a DNC conference we were at one time, mm -hmm. and a, a student asked him, well, Reverend, what can we do to get involved? He said, nobody, you know, we took our place. We didn't wait for anybody to invite mm -hmm. us to the table. You, you get involved. You know the piece that people miss about Reverend? Dr. King did not pick him up and say, I anoint you. Exactly. Reverend Jackson got the attention of Reverend James Bevel because he was a student at the University of Chicago getting his Master's in Divinity. And he had organized his two white classmates, David Wallace and Gary Massoni, and they were testing civil rights laws in Chicago. He was organizing, working with the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. He was an organizer. Reverend Bevel met him and said, hey, he went to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and said, hey, I got a guy. He is a kid, but boy, this man's on fire. If you read Uncle Andy's account of the Selma to Montgomery March, he said, we saw this young man. He was taller than everybody, and he was half crazy because he was fighting to get to the front, and he was pushing. He was pushing the boundaries as young because he was... My father's, what, a decade younger than, than he is. So it's like, they were he was already working. <laughs> so, I mean, these folks need to get up and stop acting like you're going to inherit leadership. You said you don't want kings and queens. Well, there, there are none. Get out here and work. Well, or, when, uh, Jesse, when Jesse Jr. was elected to Congress, had a press person call me and say, uh, well, is Reverend Jackson now going to be passing the baton to Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr.? I said, Reverend Jackson doesn't pass batons. You have to take it out of the dam. Well, well the thing is, he, I mean, the thing is, he, they picked up the baton when they were in, um, I mean, he just picked it up. He was all, he already had work 15. to do when he left Memphis. How much time do we have? Okay, everybody, you're going to have about 45 seconds. When you hear my voice, I need to move to the next person, okay? How about that five? Stand Please by. email your questions and comments to Four, Reverend Jesse Jackson three, at keepopealive.com. Closing thoughts. Let's talk about getting a voter registration in the hand, uh, in one hand of our college, of our high school graduates, and a diploma in the other. They should be married to one another. Attorney Daryl Jones, Transformative Justice Coalition, what say you? Thank you uh, for, for having us on. Cynthia, you're absolutely right. It's so important that our high school seniors get that registration in their hand, they need to leave and have in their minds this belief that they are a voting rights champion, that they are a voting rights champion, that their vote makes a difference, that their presence makes a difference. And it begins at that high school level. And then when they step into the shoes and they're out in the streets and off the sidewalks and they're out there marching with Latasha Brown, they're out there marching with Reverend Jackson and everyone else, they continue to push forward and being certain that others get involved and in being a voting rights champion as well. That's what we need right now. Mm. Uh, Wisconsin State Representative Lakeisha Myers, 45 seconds belong to you. I will say that I believe everything uh, that was just said, but also that activism and education go hand in hand and that is how we uh, will move forward so we have to have an active campaign to go just beyond basic registration but activate the census and make sure the young people know that they are a part of the process and they have to become leaders in the process and that comes with active voter registration and using the power of their vote hmm. reverend frank watkins well jangita just to uh, put our discussion in a broader political context and to add a little contrast to how we view voting and voter registration, whether consciously or unconsciously, what we're really talking about this morning is Ukraine. What we're talking about is what they're fighting for, the vote, democracy, and what we call freedom. In Ukraine, thousands of people are being killed and an entire country is being physically destroyed and pulverized over the issue of democracy, the right to vote. It's the thing that an autocrat, a dictator, a fascist, a racist, and a kleptocrat like Putin fears the most. Let's go to you, Reverend Dr. Todd Weary, Esquire. To date, 43 states have ratified the 26th Amendment. The states that have not 
Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi, Nevada, New Mexico, North Dakota, and Utah. The 43 states that ratified and ratified them all in 1979. So this is not about whether or not 18-year-olds are too naive. There's nothing in the 26th Amendment that says you have to be informed to have the right. And so to assume that somehow or other someone gets to impose an extra standard is not only beyond the pale, I think it is offensive to the notion of liberty. If Jesus can teach at 12, voters can vote at 18. Mm. Amen to that. Latasha Brown, the final word belongs to you. We're inside of a minute. I'll just say in 2016, millennials, generation X, the uh, young voters, younger voters dominated and at, for the first time in history outvoted the baby boomers who have just, who have, who, who have um, uh, controlled the, the voting landscape, that we're in a new era. And so I think that we have to make sure that our young people know that they have to go beyond just thinking of themselves as citizens of this current America, but as founders of a new America, America that is more equitable, more just, and more inclusive. And the ones that I talk to, that's what they see. Mm -hmm. They want to have an America that we desire and we deserve. Thank you. Amen. Keep hope alive. <laughs> Keep hope alive with Reverend Jesse Jackson. For more information on upcoming shows and guests, please visit our website at www.keephopealiveradio.com. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that, Latasha. Oh, hold on. Latasha, oh. Yep. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, sweetie. No, 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 no. You know I'm what? Sorry. No, no, no. I have a network out. Yes, got it. So I am yep. so sorry. So that's why I'm always like, if you all hear my voice, I got it. No, go. I did. I was trying to cut off. I'm so sorry. No, girl, please. You were great. Come on. You were great. And I thank you for being with us today. I got to get you on my show this week. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. I enjoyed everybody else here. Uh oh, look, everybody enjoyed you. Is it Commissioner Gong? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, call we're doing him. A lot of work in Texas. Call him. Okay, I'm gonna call him. Call him. I think he's uh he's 